Happy May to all, and welcome to this week's episode of Slave Food Conversations, where two African-American physicians, Dr. Columbus Batiste, cardiologist, and Dr. Eric Walsh, emergency room and family medicine physician with a doctorate of public health, as well as a master's in public health, explore the role of racism as a unique form of stress and the weaponization of food in the creation of health disparities in the African-American communities, irrespective of income. They discovered that eating a whole food, plant-based diet in urban communities is not only possible, but is the key to eliminating health disparities. This month of May is also known as National Mental Health Awareness Month. Mental health has been labeled as a stigma for a long time. The Slave Food team is here to help break that stigma by raising awareness for this month and providing some key tips on how the kinds of food people intake can be either protective of their mental health or detrimental. The Slave Food team welcomes special guest, Dr. Uma Nadu. Dr. Nadu is a Harvard graduate specializing in psychiatric and nutrition, psychiatry and nutrition. She founded the first hospital-based nutritional psychiatric service, psychiatry service, I'm sorry, in the United States, located in Massachusetts General Hospital. Currently, she serves as a director to her hospital and a, um, and a teacher at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Nadu is a quadruple threat, being a nutritional chef, a psychiatrist, professor, and the author of a book, This Is Your Brain on Food. For this week's talk, the three physicians will focus the discussion around Dr. Nadu's book, Mental Health Stress in the Community of Color, and the role that food can play. As always, the Slave Food team wants to thank you for your support. Please continue to spread the word about the Slave Food Project by sharing this talk, as well as subscribing on our YouTube channel under the Slave Food Project and clicking the subscribe button. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this very eye-opening conversation. Thanks, Danette. Dr. Nadu, it is <laughs> such a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm gonna tell you when, you when I when I stumbled <laughs> on your book, you know I do it. I we we get these audible books. I I receive them and I start listening. And I was just enthralled with your book. I remember sitting in the parking lot just listening. And I've listened to a lot of books, and I was just it was incredibly a wonderful book. For those of you out there who have not had the chance, make sure you check out her book. It's incredible. Thank you Pleasure. so much. I appreciate I appreciate that. <laughs> Pleasure. Yeah, I have to chime in and say the same thing. I, I was telling you before we came on. I've gone yeah. through the book now twice and really enjoyed the book uh, because there's a lot in here that a lot of us as physicians, honestly, are not aware of. Um, and when, when we practice or, or even apply to our own lives, um, and it was just really, it was groundbreaking in a lot of ways to make some of the connections that are made. And uh, when we, we, I think we might have even stumbled upon it separately, uh, Columbus. Um, and then we started talking about it and saying, Man, we got so much out of the book. So we're excited. We're really glad to have you on with us tonight. Thank you for taking time out of a Friday night to, to join us. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my work with your audience. But also, um, you know, I, I'm so grateful that when, you know, when you write a book, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of hard work. And when people really resonate and feel and take away the message, that's very meaning, meaningful to any author. So thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. Absolutely. So let's dive into it. I know Eric, you wanted to kick off. You had some yes. interest in some of the things that she had written about. I'm gonna let <laughs> yeah. you kind of uh, yeah. kind of take so the let lead. Me jump in. Normally he takes the lead, but for your book, I'll, <laughs> I'll take the lead. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about um, was was your 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 you seem to have discovered a passion for cooking um, as a as a as a professional, really. Um, you mentioned that growing up, most of the women in your life were amazing cooks. And I, yes. I'm a huge fan of Indian food. My family's Jamaican, so there's a strong influence of Indian food yes. in Jamaica. Yes. We curry a lot of things and use chickpeas and stuff. And um, I, I really want you to talk about what was the first thing you really feel you mastered um, mm -hmm. kind of as you, you walked into this, 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 you know, this world of, of, of cooking? 
Absolutely. You know, the interesting thing is I came because of all those great cooks in uh, my family, I came to it very late in life. But my mom uh, recognized that I loved science. So she's actually a double broadered physician. She taught me how to bake and, and she would teach me how to measure and then she would manage the oven. But I think that, you know, there's something when I think back at it, uh, think back about it, there was almost an infusion, a sort of cultural infusion, um, an infusion of the environment because I didn't want to go to preschool. So whatever got in my head, I wanted to hang out with my maternal grandma um, and and spend the days with her. And that's you know the reason my book is dedicated to her. She was an excellent cook. So we literally, when I think about it, we pick fresh vegetables from the garden. Um, I would help her clean the vegetables. She would cook, and then we'd you know sit down with my grandfather. This is how I spent my days instead of going to preschool. I thought it was a lot of fun, <laughs> but you know it's it's when you think about it, you realize that as a child you absorb your environment. And I had um, yes. happened to come from a family where you know they driven and a lot of physicians in the family, but also a couple of Ayurvedic practitioners. So there was also the influence of science, nutrition, the joy of food, the love of family. And the, all of those components. And my grandparents taught me how to meditate, taught me yoga. And so I came into the world with this holistic model. But coming to the food, that came later on when I moved away. I realized, I remember my mother being panicked because she realized, you know, that I, I, I knew and I'd seen all the recipes, but I didn't know how to cook. So one of the first things I'd learned because I'd seen her actually make this many times over was, uh, you know, homemade cheese, the paneer that, that, that we make, and made from sort of, uh, made from milk, if you consume that. And it was just, what was interesting about it was that I had always watched her. And now, you know, you can go to the supermarket, you can buy paneer, which is quite, quite different. Uh, but growing up, we always made it. And so I had watched it, watched her do it. And she had taught me how to blend spices. And so when I did move away to study, I began my own cooking journey, and one of the first things I tried was was how to make the paneer, and I did master it, I, I'm, I'm grateful to say. Um, but more importantly, what I found was this immense joy and creativity in, in being around food. And I think that that, to me, uh, was really a very special gift because it, it I guess it brought me closer to being with them, uh, to that sense of family. But also, I was interested, and I, I just wanted to do more. That's incredible. That's incredible. I'm gonna give it back to Eric, but it resonates with me because growing up, I remember, you know, I was the youngest of five, and my mom would bake things from scratch, and you know, I'd go out and play, but I'd also be inside the kitchen with her. And so she, if she was making a little pie, I had a little small cap, and I'd make one too. I'd roll the dough and. <laughs> I, I'd help her make the roux and, and begin to saute. And I learned all the principles, although I right. never really cooked. And then I remember- But you were uh, around it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's amazing the influence from a young age. That, that's, uh, that's profound. That leads us down this, this road of nutrition within medicine. Exactly, because you you know there's such a gap in what we learn in medical school and these conversations would happen at the dinner table because my uncles were, and my aunt, uh, two of my aunts were, you know, medical residents. So there would be this conversation going on. And here I was, you know, eating my food, doing my thing, not going to preschool and uh, having a lot of fun. But, you know, it was a very special time. And I feel like it was probably what brought forward in me this reason to practice a holistic and integrated model, because I just felt that, you know, you needed more options for people to have other than just a prescription pad. I really felt that it was a very powerful tool to have a prescription pad that the people needed more than that um, to work with. So that actually, you lead right into the next question, because we really did want to ask, uh, Dr. Matisse has done a brilliant job of this, where he works, uh, especially as a cardiologist. Um, mm -hmm. You know, cardiologists actually kind of butter their bread uh, um, on procedures, but he, I mean, he told stories on our, on our, on our, on our show here, of how he's actually, you know, led people to cardiovascular health without any procedures and moved them away from medications. And it is a quite a profound thing. Using a whole food, plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. um, what was it, what, what really, tr you know, how did you really uh, launch this into your practice in such a way that, you know, people kind of seek you for it now? Um, and you, you, in the book, you're like an alternative. Like a lot of the stories you give, it's like they've tried this and that, and then they come to you. How, how did that happen? 
So, you know, it started, uh, it started small and it started with my, my interest, my delving into the research, my studying, the nu nu studying nutrition, uh, going to culinary school. All of these components happened at different times, but I essentially, um, I know that what I did is followed things that I loved to do. But there were two particular things that happened early on in my career as a very, uh, very timid resident, uh, a patient yelled at me. And in the Boston area, our favorite coffee is Dunkin' Donuts and it originated in Massachusetts. So you're gonna see people with their big cups of, of coffee. And he, I had prescribed the medication about three weeks prior and he came for follow-up appointment, but you know, he was angry and upset and he started yelling at me, telling me that I had caused him to gain weight. Now the reality, is Prozac can cause weight gain, and I had prescribed that for his depression. But I had his, you know, I had this computer in front of me, and I could see that it wasn't. He had he had struggled with weight before he came to see me, and it wasn't wasn't the prescription at that moment. And in that moment of sort of being a timid resident and being yelled at, I looked at his coffee and I said, you know, Bill, um, tell me tell me what you put in your coffee. And it distracted him, but at the same time. He said, oh, you know, I get one every morning and I put this and this and that. So I sat down, sat him down with me at the computer and I'm not much of a calorie count, I have to tell you, but in that moment it was meaningful because I we, we calculated that he had more than a quarter cup of processed creamer and eight wow. teaspoons of sugar, right, in a 20 ounce cup. And so when I proved to him that 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 was a lot of extra empty calories he was taking in because coffee on its own, you know, if, unless you have... Uh, a set unless your anxiety is triggered or something else is pretty healthy. Um, certainly from from my knowledge and my research of it. And um, I saw the light bulb go off in his eyes, like, oh, this this is something I can change and this is making sense. So that actually at the same time was my aha moment because I thought, wow, he was came and yelling. I interpreted information for him about a simple cup of coffee and now he's sitting down talking to me and he wants to find out, well, what can I do differently? And it really began this, um, it began this journey for me of asking the questions. And I know you have such limited time to talk to people that I would ask, you know, if I'm starting medication, you know, how's your diet? Like, wh what are you doing for exercise? And ask it in a, is, is in a gentle and was respective, respectful way as possible, but include it. And this really grew over time. I think the thing that really brought my work forward uh, was a couple of things, good mentorship, and I was, I was fortunate to have that where I am. But the other thing is all the burgeoning research around the gut microbiome. And, you know, we started to see these pieces come together. So whereas many of my mentors had studied methylfolate, magnesium, and vitamin D, and omega-3s, nutritional psychiatry, I like to say, put, that, put all of those things together on a plate. You know, because you don't need one nutrient or one ingredient. You generally need a plate of food. And, and I think that's what nutritional, certainly for me, that's what nutritional psychiatry as a practice did. So when I had the opportunity to share my intersecting um, worlds and to say, you know, I think I, is, is there a way to start this as a, as a consultation service? Um, it really came from people who loved nutrition, who had studied um, in that area, but who were psychiatrists and supported it. And it grew from there. So it's still very small. I, I don't want to overstate it. It's very small and it's a consultation practice, uh, but it, it does exist. And it's, it's certainly grown from, from when we started. So I'm excited about that and uh, the ability to bring the message forward. Yeah, well, definitely don't don't understate it either, because that's powerful. It's powerful. And and within the field of medicine, although things seem as if it's more receptive now, I imagine when you started it, as when I did, it was not quite so receptive. It's quite a bit of a of a leap to move and say, I'm, I'm practicing this way. You're almost seen as that that doc or, you know, or oh, right. he, he does he or she does this or that or the right. other. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting, um, Dr. Peterson, because I, I spoke about, you know, learning yoga and meditation as a child. And there were times in uh, early days in Boston when, you know, there was mind-body medicine and, and uh, Herbert Benson and a lot of that, the work that he was doing. And, you know, I think that people would probably wonder, like, what what is this? You know, how, why is it part of, you know, why is it part of anything? Um, not me, of course, but I, I, I and I, I think about that because now the, the uh, Benson Henry Institute at Mass General, I will tell you that they were one of the most needed services during the pandemic because they offered mindfulness training, all of the stuff that 
really helped even uh, frontline workers, uh, caregivers, patients, and everything. So, you know, it's, I think it's all on the spectrum, right? Because initially, you, people might be behind your back rolling their eyes, you know, yes. or thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. What is she going to tell them? Turmeric, you know, uh, <laughs> but, but you, you build it slowly, you know, and it's, it's uh, the believers. I've had a lot of really good so support from the primary care physicians, some of the cardiologists who just want to partner around sending patients who, who can eat healthier because we've realized that, that, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we realize that nutrition is a lifestyle measure. So it's something we should be involving ourselves in. One of the, one of the probably the most um, uh, kind of uh, engaging part of the book for me was your description of the connection between the gut and the brain. I want us to pause there, and I want for our listeners for you to do just give a little bit about the connections. Um, I've read it before, but I like the way you said it probably best around serotonin receptors in the gut and their percent mm -hmm. compared to serotonin receptors in the brain and what that means for mood. Absolutely. So um, I, I, my, the first chapter of my book for a very specific reason is called the gut-brain romance because, you know, romance can be good on some days and not so good on other days. Mm -hmm. But it, in my book, it's really about sharing the message of food, which is that if you're not eating a great diet on a sudden day, that, that gut-brain connection and that romance doesn't do so well. But if you're eating a healthier meal, it strengthens that connection, just, just kind of simply speaking. But to break it down, I think one of the most fascinating things that I've that I discovered was that you know went back to embryology and the gut and brain come from the exact same uh, cells in the embryo. Then they divide up, you know, because people will look at me like how the, how can they be connected? They're so far apart. And then they they form the organs, the gut and the brain, and then they're connected by the tenth cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, um, which I like to call or, or explain it to people as a two way superhighway because it works 24-7, 365 days a year. It allows for bi-directional messaging between the gut and brain and brain and gut. And this is, this is exactly what happens all the time. But then you also need to add a few more facts to, to understand the whole picture. One is that, um, you know, for the pandemic times, we need to remember that about 70% of our immune system is in the gut. And we need to realize that there are many medications being prescribed. I mean, during the pandemic, Zoloft, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, went on shortage in the United States due to the uptake of prescriptions. So SSRIs, or these medications, work through serotonin. And more than 90 to 95% of the receptors are in the gut. So when you prescribe those medications, if you do, very often the first five to 10 days, someone will have you know, gastrointestinal discomfort in different uh, of different kinds and different levels, but you know it's it's partly related to that. So, I, I break it down for people that way because when you start to put those things together, you realize that when you eat a less healthy meal, that doesn't help that romance. And what it's actually doing is that the breakdown products of digestion are not great, and they don't help the microbes that live in the gut environment. Um, and they need good food to thrive. Just like we need good food to thrive, they need good food to thrive. So we don't feed them fiber-rich foods from a plant-rich diet. Um, they start to not do well, but the bad bugs who live with them um, start to do well. And when they thrive, that's when you get the setup for inflammation, dysbiosis, or basically, simply said, imbalance in the gut environment. So one of the things I want you to talk about, we talk about, uh, I know I do in a lot of my talks is serotonin. Mm -hmm. um, and so many people take SSRIs, these serotonin mm -hmm. selective reuptake inhibitors. Talk to us about the importance of serotonin because we're going to switch to stress and mood in a second. Yeah. Uh, but this is one of the foundational components and why it's so important that actually uh, there's so many receptors in the gut. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's not something that we entirely knew. But it was discovered with with all of the the, the sort of research that was going on, you know, between um, it, it, physicians who went to medical school like two decades ago, really didn't learn about the gut microbiome. And between 2013 and 2017, there were about 12,000 articles in this area. So it really wow. is what brought a lot of this home, in terms, especially for me, um, in terms of the gut brain access and mental health. 
Now, serotonin has really been how we've targeted these different conditions, um, how the medications have been developed, and it's not just depression and anxiety. You know, we use SSRIs for OCD, we use SSRIs for trauma, we use it across the board. Um, and where I think, um, where I feel mental health and, and the definitions in psychiatry miss the mark on two ways. Psychiatry does not have a tissue diagnosis. You know, it, it, you can't culture sputum. You can't, you can't uh, take a blood test. Although you know, some recent research is showing otherwise, but it's still new. So, so we really are based on criteria and observation. And I understand that's how the field has developed. But the problem is there are many people that fall into gaps of different diagnostic categories. You may have someone with ADHD who's depressed. You may have someone with OCD who's anxious, and what I find is that people are boxed into something and then you know the prescription pad comes out and I feel that that needs to change in mental health. Mm. And I feel that where our diagnostic categories are not perfect, we don't have a perfect system, we need to address that through how many tools we offer someone to feel better. You know, so if someone's not sleeping, it's not just here, here's trazodone, it's you know, what, what are you doing for sleep hygiene? You know, what are you doing for hydration? What, are you exercising? All of these things, it's all a system. So I think that way too much, in my opinion, way too much emphasis has been placed on serotonin as something that we use to, um, to, to you know, selective serotonin reuptake yeah. inhibitors is what we use to treat these conditions. I think that I think there's more to the, 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 the picture. And I want to say that, you know, I still prescribe medications. They have been life-saving for many of my patients. So it's not about one or the other. It's really about how do we bring these two worlds together? And someone, you know, we have to eat. The, the power's at the end of our fork. We're eating meals, we're eating several mm -hmm. times a day. Why not make a choice that's for our better mental health? You know, that that's how I like to think about it. And I, I guess the, the next component of that in the book, you talk about how stress impacts this relationship between the gut microbiome and the gut and the brain. And one of the things, and Dr. Matisse can chime in, one of the things we talk about a lot is stress. Yeah. Um, we think stress is the secret, um, kind of the secret sauce to, the, to help to racial health disparities in this country. Mm -hmm. So before we get into that part of it, just talk about how stress impacts uh, this, this super highway, the relationship, mm -hmm. the gut microbiome and all of that. Um Absolutely. So, you know, in the in the, the, the in the in the gut microbi mi microbiome, that's referring to the genetic material of the microbiota or the hundred trillion cells that live down there. If you were to put them together, they would probably be the size of a small to medium avocado. But essentially, they live down there, and they're there to really help us. But Amongst them, you know, there are five different types, there are five phyla, but amongst them, there are bad guys as well. So it's up to us to really keep the balance of feeding the good, uh, good bacteria, the good microbes to, to for our better health, because they do multiple things. And, you know, I almost sometimes think of the, the, the gut as Grand Central Station, because, of course, you know, being a psychiatrist, the brain is the most important to me, but uh -huh. the gut does, does, does have all these relationships, right, with sleep, circadian rhythm, hormones, immunity, balance, you know, fending off infection, um, and then mental health amongst others. So I think that, um, you know, it, 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 it behooves us to, to, to understand that it is this, 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 this almost um, central place where almost everything is connected. So stress, you know, we, we experience stress. I, you know, I think it's one of the biggest drivers of, of problems. And um, what basically happens is that those microbes experience, you know, besides food, stress is also impacts them because what happens when we're stressed is we get that cortisol response. And, you know, the cascade of what happens basically disrupts that gut environment as well. And once that happens, you, you also have, um, you have an imbalanced gut, you have, um, we have microbes that are just not doing well. And it's, it's one of the ways that, you know, you then set off what, what ultimately causes inflammation in the gut environment. And inflammation in recent research is really showing to be the basis of a lot of conditions like depression and anxiety. So gut inflammation becomes brain inflammation because of this, this, this connection. And even in Alzheimer's research, you know, they're really thinking about the interventions that we can do through food to reduce inflammation. 
Um, now, of course, we, we don't have a cure or anything like that, but we're just looking at how, how can we also impact this? What are the different ways we can do that? So, you know, I, I sometimes wish I had a, a better solution to stress because it just, it's so, it's so prevalent in, in, in every condition. Um, and it just worsens, worsens everything. Good. Uh, I'll, I'll do one more. I'll let Dr. Batiste jump in as well. But uh, the, la I, 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 the last one that I really um, wanted to tie this into what we do is around, especially 2020. 2020 really seems to be a year where social injustice was highlighted in this country along, along racial lines. Um, and of course, predominantly initially uh, over the last you know, 13, 14 months, it was around African-Americans and racial uh, discrimination. And then, of course, we saw a whole, it shifted even to Asian um, Americans and issues around race and racism in the country. How does, how do these kind of, um, one of your colleagues at Harvard is a good, someone we actually look up to, uh, Dr. David Williams, um, who does a lot of this work. Um, and we, we, how does this impact the stress, the mental health, not just of the individual now, I mean, this is the collective stress of a yes. whole group of people when these kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, whether they're microaggressions that we deal with da daily in our own private lives or these macroaggressions when we watch something unfold on television that just seems so horrific in the treatment mm -hmm. of someone just because of what they look like. Absolutely. You know, it's so it's so inextricably linked to to mental well-being, to mental fitness, to how, how we cope with. Um, with any condition, and I feel that um, one of the, for me, one of the, the biggest observations is that, you know, what COVID shone a light on is these disparities because pre pre existing conditions placed certain demographic groups like African Americans at a higher risk. And you know, not just a higher risk, higher risk of death, higher risk of risk of complications, um, higher risk of you know uh, poor recovery, and so I think it just really um, un uncovered it in a certain way, right? It was always there, of course. Many of us have known that, but COVID really shone the light on it because of everything that came forth, and I feel that along with that and everything that was uncovered during 2020. The sort of collective stress uh, uh, on 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 you know the African American races in the country, then then the Asian Americans, ha has created what I consider to be some research has called it the parallel pandemic, um, but I sort of think of it as the silent pandemic because you know mental health is just so rampant right now. There, um, you know, were I, I mentioned that Zoloft was on shortage last June. That was because about a month prior, we know that Express Scripts did a survey and there were new prescriptions for anxiety, insomnia, and depression that were new. So people hadn't been prescribed that before and all of those were increased. Then in summer, the CDC released some scary statistics. Now there was definitely an increase in depression and anxiety, but 11% of Americans thought about suicide. Mm -hmm. wow. And then, you know, so so it's and, and and I say these as generalized statistics, but realize that, you know, when when a certain demographic in this country is already suffering with the racial injustices, then you add the you know, the pandemic stress to this, and then you add in things like access to equal access to um, you know, fresh food or or the elements of food insecurity or food deserts, and it's you know, it becomes a a very difficult, very painful um, situation to deal with. And I think that it's one that if, if there's one thing we can take away from, from this pandemic, it's what can we do better? What can we do differently um, to, you know, to, to really um, help, help people be healthier? I think food is one of those things, but it's not just, you know, that's one dimension, um, right. but it's, it's so many things. Yeah, no, that that's that's powerful. I mean, you know, we we use oftentimes inside of our talks and in discussion, we use terminology called nutritional stress, right? And yeah, and we yeah. refer we reference nutritional stress as it's of course it's not eating health promoting foods and it's uh, and it's eating disease forming foods. And when you look in communities of color, as you mentioned, and we bring this up oftentimes, that you essentially have this crucible 
of conflict yeah. that happens of yeah. these multiple aspects of stress that are really building this disparity that exists that mm -hmm. even I was even unaware of a, there's a mental health disparity in terms of of looking at the degree of, of impact in communities of color across the board there. Uh, so, I mean, if so, the question is, does food really truly contribute to to mental health and if our mental illness? And if it does, okay. can food really get us out? Can we eat food to really beat this thing of mental health? I think uh, I would say that the short answer is yes, but but let me explain. Let me explain a little bit. Um, I think it's not just one one dimension because someone might have might already be for whatever reason. Um, it might be a medication that I prescribe. You know, it might be weight gain from medication. It might be um, a, a poor eating habits that led led to some um, weight gain either during the pandemic or before. And you know, I think that there's always. Uh, my opinion is. We're going to eat food unless you have an intolerance or an allergy. Um, or, you know, you're in a diet war and you want to give up one food and not another, which just drives me completely crazy. Um, unless, unless there's some issue that you can't eat a certain food, it's there. It's available. You can make a better choice. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be done with judgment. It's just what can you do to tweak your diet away from the standard American diet, which we know is horrible. Yes. So, you know, so it's, 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 I think it starts there um, in, the, in the sense that if, if, if you know or have identified or been told by, by a doctor uh, that, you know, you are experiencing nutritional stress because it's, you, you're not necessarily making the best choices. Um, I think it, if, we, if we don't address it, it becomes a setup for failure because, you know, I had, I had a, a young mother um, of color years ago who came in and said, you know, Dr. Naidu, I, I got the cereal for my son. That's what his little son came in with her. And uh, I got the cereal because you told me whole grains are important. And I would talk about healthy whole grains if you consume them, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then with, with weight issues and mental health, I also talk about the right kind of carbohydrates, meaning more complex versus, um, you know, that, that will be more um, sort of gut friendly and less weight producing. So lower, low, lower glycemic, and um, she he was eating the cereal, and I said, "Oh, we, what cereal?" I mean, I knew by looking at it, it wasn't healthy. So I said, "Oh, what cereal is that?" So she showed me the photograph of the box because I taught her to take a photograph of different foods and a food label, and um, it, it, you know, it's it's a wily thing, food labeling, because it's within the the legal guidelines. But it was co-labeled whole grain. It was not even in the first three or four ingredients on the label. Yeah. Yeah. But they have the ability to label it whole grain, and yet, what what was it laden with? Hidden sources of sugar. Yeah. So the child was eating a little cup of it and uh, happily having it. But, you know, it's those types of things where if we if if we don't step in, uh, I don't I can't take on the food industry. I can't take and take on farming in this country. But, you know, if we can educate our patients, then as doctors, we can start to um, start to impact them directly just by those those little things. Amen. That's that's extremely powerful and important, really, to kind of just stop and ask first is the first step that's there. So if you were to, you know, if the top three things, you know, and there's, we talk, spoke about the pandemic of mental health issues and really you spoke about a young mother, but it's really happening in our teens. So numerous people, yes. uh, patients, they're reporting their teenage teenagers are having mental health issues, mm -hmm. especially have been highlighted during this pandemic. What are the top three things to avoid before we transition to being more positive in terms of what you can eat? What are the three things, if you had to say your top three, Avoid these if you're prone towards anxiety, depression, um, OCD, that sort of a thing. Okay. So the first one is the added and refined sugars. There are upwards of 200 other names for sugar on food labels. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to know that what is on our food label and need to understand where the hidden sources of sugar. Because they, again, it goes back to things like brown rice syrup. People associated brown rice with a healthier grain but actually brown rice is, syrup is a form of sugar. Um, these are easily things you can find on the internet, by the way, just, uh, just in terms of these lists. But along with artificial and refined sugars goes artificial sweeteners because for the most part, there are some newer ones out there which are still being studied, but for the most part, they actually worsen mental health symptoms. They drive anxiety, they worsen depression. 
The next category is those uh, processed junk foods, fast foods, ultra processed foods. It's it's very hard in our society to to live without package of processed foods, but but we try our best to move on that continuum away from just the standard American diet. So I say that understanding that it's hard, but those are things where the additives, the dyes, the the colorants, um, the um, uh, stabilizers, all just are not not good for our brain. Um, uh, all, all those symptoms. And then um, the third category is processed vegetable oils, which are often used in things like fast food restaurants because essentially, um, you know, they're less expensive, but they're pro-inflammatory. And that, you know, we talked about the gut and the brain and the inflammation, and that becomes a problem. And I'll just, just mention one other thing, that there have been studies that have shown that trans fats are associated with more, with worsening aggression, so, you know, it's sort of this, this category of foods that we want to just think about and, and cut back on slowly or replace with better choices when we can. Oh, that's powerful. And that's, that's helpful. And just like with your first story, we brought up the patient who went to that particular donut shop and had the 20 ounce of coffee, right? You describe having essentially um, uh, eight teaspoons of sugar and people oftentimes don't equate what's on the label that four grams equals one teaspoon. So That's in reality, right. he was having 32 grams of sugar. And okay. if you conceptualize that, you're like, wow, I'm having that much. But that's literally and, how and much a person has. Exactly. And you know, what I like about what you said is that uh, in, in, in the US, our recipes are standardized to pounds and ounces. But our food labels are in grams. So people do not know that four grams of sugar are one teaspoon, and they do not know how to interpret food labels. So it's it's sort of, and I'm not saying everyone, I, I know that some people can, but it, but I'm saying it's a gap. It's sort of, people don't then understand, well, I, my doctor said this, or the guidelines said that, and you know, um, this is what I'm consuming. So it's really, it's really powerful. Those little tips are really powerful for people to know. They are, uh, they I, are. I, I think one of the guests we recently had on was Michael Moss, who wrote the book Salt, Sugar, Fat, and the book Hooked. And we I just read the book Hooked. And that's one of the things he said, that literally um, the food labels were, the, the food industry was actually okay with the food, but creating the food labels. They figured out a way to actually use the food labels to their advantage. And I've never heard what you, anybody say what you just said, which is this, you know, the brown rice syrup is a brilliant way to do that. Because if you go to your doctor and they say, eat, don't eat white rice, eat brown rice. Don't eat white rice, eat brown rice. Say, oh, brown rice syrup. This must be really this good. This must be good. Yeah. <laughs> so they figure yeah, I, out I've seen it actually, on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, it's, that's it. It's, it's, sorry, go ahead. It, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a huge issue. And, and I feel sometimes, uh, you know, I, I just, as a physician, just want to be able to tell people as much as I can so they look for these things. Uh, because there was a study in, in February published in a nutrition journal that, that really showed how processed and ultra-processed foods are no short of being addictive. Um, they're made to be hyperpalatable. French fries have sugar in them. We don't taste it. But the research and development that goes into it makes them hyperpalatable. Because, so, so that's the reason you, can't ups, you, you always want to upsize. When you upsize, then you can't put down the bag of the, the bag of fries. Um, so you know it's all these little little tricks that have happened that happen within the law, and so it's really on us as consumers, physicians, advocates to 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 know these things and to to avoid them when we can. Wow, you literally, literally must have been doing psychotherapy on me because you knew I was getting ready to ask you about addiction and whether or not these foods are addictive. And you really just stole the answer right there. So, so I take your response in that you you subscribe to the fact that foods can be addictive. Is that correct? You know, I, yeah. I, so there are certain foods that I do think where where science has shown us that, for example. Um, Add in refined sugars because I, I want to make the distinction between um, fruit and having a piece of fruit and then the natural sugar because I definitely want to encourage people to eat a piece or two of fruit a day. But um, the add in refined sugars basically work on the dopamine re reward pathways that are similar to cocaine. So when when I take people seriously when they tell me they're addicted to sugar because in fact they often feel that way and they feel chemically that way in their body, they feel the cravings. So I think that while addiction is a strong term, I do think that 
There are people who who just can't put down certain foods. I most often see it with sugar. Um, but at the same time, the other distinction to to be uh, be be respectful of with the nutritional psychiatry is that you know eating disorders are a whole other spectrum of psychiatric diagnosis. And often in those individuals, they have to heal their relationship with food before you could start saying, well, let's tweak a little bit of this and let's you know, move you away from the standard American diet. There's a lot of healing and, and treatment that has to be done that's often quite intensive. Family therapy, relationship work, psychotherapy, as well as the food. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's, 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 it, it's actually not the best thing to, um, it, it's actually, let me put it this way. So if someone has an eating disorder, that has to be uh, treated to a safer, better place first, before you can sort of tweak the actual elements of these foods are better, these foods are uh, not gonna help you and things like that. Uh, that's powerful, that's powerful. That's something that we've begun focusing on too as well is really the issue of, of folks sometimes forgiving themselves. And Eric brings this up an awful lot. Um, and looking at the confounding issues, the social circumstances that come in play, confounding issues there that form these habits and why they turn to it. You know, we love to joke and we say that stress is simply dessert spelled backwards and they go hand in hand that folks, they go, they turn to it, they turn to it and go on that those dates with Ben and Jerry's when they have an opportunity. Uh, Absolutely. So it's, it's I, it, it, please go ahead. I was like, when, I, when I was working in addiction medicine, um, yeah. training in addiction medicine, um, I remember we were doing like nicotine classes at the Veterans Hospital in Loma Linda where, where we, uh, Columbus and I trained. And uh, I remember we, we, there was a whole thing in one of the classes on how when someone who's addicted to nicotine gets promoted at work, they light up a cigarette to celebrate. If they get fired from work, they light up a cigarette to deal with the fact that they've lost their job. And they were talking about the fact that there's, there's like a, an emotional buffer that they're given because they never really deal with life without that dopamine, the, the dopamine release, the rush uh, mm. of, the, of the nicotine to kind of try and manage how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I started wondering, does food kind of work the same way for some of us? Where, you know, we get a, we, something good happens, we celebrate with food. <laughs> something bad happens, no. we actually go in and suffer yeah. In with the food, with yeah. food. Uh, and, and I'm, it makes it difficult. And I like what you just said. We've got to step back. We, we talk a lot about come out of the kitchen, right? Yeah. How are you sleeping? Yeah. How are you exercising? Yeah. Yeah. What are your relationships like? Have you forgiven yourself? Have you forgiven mm -hmm. others? Um, mm -hmm. And I like what you're saying because some, many of us, our relationship to food is actually a byproduct of this emotional buffering. And we've never mm -hmm. really maybe learned to deal with life without it. Yeah. I, I think that's an excellent point. And I think it's it's one of the things that people have to start to unpack when they work on that relationship with food. It may not be, not everyone has an eating disorder, but it might just be that, you know, you have turned to that tub of ice cream or you have celebrated in a certain way. And some of it is how do we, um, how do we, I guess, move ourselves in a continuum of, you know, as a chef, I really care that food is tasty and delicious. I don't think people should eat diet food that doesn't taste good because it's not sustainable. So part of it is how do we move ourselves towards delicious options? It does take more time because it, you know we kind of have to prepare it or throw in those spices or do something that, that may take a little bit more work. But how do we move ourselves to those choices to, um, to, to th that, that are healthy whole foods that you make from, um, that, that you, you sort of making, you know what's going into them and you 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 really are taking care of your body, you know, but you're also taking care of your brain. And I think it's it's somewhere in that um, in that realm. Absolutely, great guys. Um, um, we've got a couple questions, and um, one of them is around the sugar question. Mm -hmm. And uh, the statement is: Is sugar and added sugar so bad? And should it be eliminated altogether, or can it be eaten in moderation? So that's a, that's a great question. You know, I, I don't like to demonize ingredients uh, because it goes back to what my colleagues just said. You know, we, we it, it's not about beating ourselves up or making ourselves feel bad. It's, it's sort of, I feel during the pandemic, we have to have grace with ourselves because it's been hard on everyone in different ways. So what I would say about sugar is it's a form of sugar that is important. I like people to eat fruit, 
a couple of pieces. So berries are my favorite, low glycemic fruit, great, rich in anti anthocyanins. But if you're putting eight teaspoons of sugar in your coffee, I'm gonna ask you to consider cutting back on that because that's just not good for you. Um, my favorite way to sweeten something is, is, and I mean this, a little drop or drizzle of honey because honey, especially things like nook honey, come with other uh, benefits. Now, that's if you consume honey, maybe you don't. And if you don't, maybe you have to find a different form of sweetening. It's not about, it's not an all or none. If you're having sugar, have it in moderation, be aware of the consequences. And if you're struggling with your mental well being and your mental health, you might want to think about cutting back because sugar worsens depression and drives mm -hmm. anxiety. So, so it's, it, you know, it's in context of those things. Okay. Um, the other question is, what is the best way to improve someone's mental well-being? I like to um, I like to ask people if they're coming to see me for the nutritional psychiatry aspect. Uh, so I'll address that first. I ask ask them, you know, you're coming in to see me. What's one habit that you think that you like to fix, and what's one thing that you're doing well? And um, so once they have identified something, I'm eating a candy bar every afternoon to keep me awake because I've eaten lunch. And by 2.33, I need a cup of coffee plus a candy bar. If not, I can't make it the rest of the afternoon. And start with a habit that they've identified because awareness is the, one of the most powerful things. If they're aware of it, they know there's something up, then you can work with them to what can you replace? What can you do differently? Also tracking the emotional feelings of the emotions of, of what you've eaten for lunch or how you feel when you eat that. Those, to me, the moment a person can, can start to tweak one habit and they feel a difference emotionally and physically, they want to do more. Then they want a list of 10 things that you can give them. But they, mm -hmm. in other words, it opens up their motivation right. to, to make healthier changes. So that, that's usually where I start. Uh, but each case is different. It tends to be personalized for everyone so much now because of the gut microbiome being like a thumbprint. But at the right. same time, those are some easy things that are, are low hanging fruit to start with. Absolutely. Um, so with regard to the COVID, and I know we touched on it briefly when we were talking um, here, but have you seen an uptick in, you know, um, requests for, you know, emotional and mental support as a result of COVID? And if so, what would you say are the main contributors uh, for that? Absolutely. So recent um, research has shown that there's an increase, uh, significant increase in mental health conditions and survivors of COVID. Um, now, separate to individuals who've suffered with COVID and survived, there are also just an uptick of things like anxiety, depression, insomnia, trauma. Um, there's also an increase, I have to say, of use of substances, drugs, and alcohol. With confinement and, and lockdown at different stages, people just consumed more alcohol and drugs. Um, the other thing in mental health is that abuse was in the rise because individuals were captive with someone who might have been abusing them. So, right. you know, all of these things are, this is this is why I talk about the silent pandemic are on the rise. And I've seen specifically an increase in anxiety, depression, insomnia, which we people are calling Corona somnia. Oh. And, um, you know, as, as well as trauma, people have either been frontline workers or exposed to a family member who's sick or lost someone, or, or just, just the trauma of how life has changed. In the past year, uh, those are the things I'm seeing um, the most of. Okay. And with regard to the African American community, as a result of the media and the focus on a lot of the the social injustices, um, you know, are you seeing a lot of a lot more of your patients coming to you as a result of some of those things that that they're witnessing? Maybe not personally, but as a result of a second secondhand uh, situation. Absolutely. Absolutely, I think I think that um, it's it's painful to, to, to watch. It's it's painful for for anyone to watch, and and I would say that that people are um, riled up and 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 upset and and needing some sort of emotional support around that. And for me, it's not necessarily medication. Um, it can often be just a form of talking therapy, just a form of working with someone so that you feel heard, that you have a sounding board for those emotions that are coming through 
that might have been pent up or might have been uncapped by some of what, what you're witnessing, even on the news, on your personal life, or you know, your personal environment right now. Right. Eric or Columbus, did you guys want to add to that? Well, I mean, I think it's powerful um, what Dr. Nadu just mentioned. I think the and what she's what she's what I'm hearing from her is that she's trying to provide resources, whether or not it's through therapy and discussion and letting folks know. And that really ties in very strongly with one of the concepts we oftentimes bring out in terms of stress equals demands minus resources. And so when folks understand that they have there's considerable resources available to them that a lot enables them to mount a challenge response instead of a stress response, there's a potential for a beneficial outcome as opposed to a detrimental or a health impairing um, outcome. So very, very well said. And I would, I would just jump in and say, um, I agree with that totally. I think the other danger as African-Americans sometimes we do have is we can be over-medicated. Um, sometimes it is easier to just try and medicate away the problem. Mm. Uh, what, our, what our company did, where, I, where I'm, a medical director is we um, actually created a national um, uh, African American kind of resource group. And we've begun to have discussions once a month by Zoom um, uh, around key issues. And you know, we talked about the COVID vaccine. There was a lot of anxiety and fear among African Americans about the vaccine. Um, we are now gearing up to do one. Uh, and matter of fact, I told a lot of them to to tune into tonight, so that because they, they were interested in your. I told them about your book and they were interested about how stress <laughs> impacts the gut and the brain. And um, so, um, and actually they want, they want to make sure we share the recording to all of the uh, African-American employees we have and, be, and, and others across the country, because this is a topic that is really meaningful to them because it comes back to a couple of things that you've highlighted through this. One of them is tradition and family. Um, that's a reoccurring theme when you speak and it's very genuine. Um, you know, it's obvious you come from a, a tight-knit family that was very strong and supportive and gave you great role models. My family's West Indian, um, and it, it was a very similar kind of upbringing that we get um, in, in that sense. But you also bring up something else, and that's fellowship. Um, mm -hmm. Even outside of the family, fellowship is important. And for us as African-Americans, um, and I love that you bring in um, some of your spiritual upbringing, but for most, many African-Americans, I won't say most, but many, church has been that place. Um, a, a haven where you can actually find a safe place, um, obviously the launching point for the civil rights movement, um, and it, it is such a powerful thing. And we as physicians sometimes have to realize these resources, that these, the fellowship that you get. And, you know, in some of the Eastern religions, they talk about meditation. Um, in church, they talk about prayer. I think someone you know, we'll probably even put that in, in our, I'm sure that's in our chat somewhere. Uh, that, you know, there is somewhere to go with all of this. I don't know that African-Americans would have survived in colonial, um, in the colonial okay. British, French world, or in the mm -hmm. slavery of America without those spiritual resources. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that people understand they're still available. Um, and obviously, mm -hmm. there's no judgment. People can find the different ways to do it. But there is a power in that connection. Um, Solomon, who wrote the, uh, three of the books of the Bible, says, laughter doeth a soul good like medicine, um, and speaks to the fact. Some people, I, I remember being asked, why do black people make such good comedians? And I said, sometimes the best way to deal with pain is to laugh, um, you know, um, and it, it makes for good medicine. So, you know, all of that is really important in turning these things on. And COVID hit at the heart of all of that. You couldn't get together and physically fellowship. You couldn't get together in your prayer group. You couldn't go to yoga class. You couldn't, all the things that a lot of people use to cope with life were suddenly snatched from them. And what were they left with? I saw Will Smith with his shirt off, talking about his worst shape of his life. And what were you left with? He was talking about the muffins he was eating in the middle of the night. So, so, you know, your work is really important. And one of the reasons I asked about the stress connection to all of the science that you present is because a lot of people, the science, it may not be as clear, but the stress is. Right. Absolutely. They understand stress. And that's one of right. the things that resonated so nicely about your book is that you bring that out and talk about healing in the midst of, of many difficult uh, conditions that we won't even get time to get to tonight. Thank you for saying that. Uh, I, definitely, I definitely think it's important, so I appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, thank you.
No. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, we this has been incredible. I do have one last ask of you, uh, Dr. Oh. Nadu, just before as we wrap things up, is I want you to give folks three top tier foods, plant rich foods that can be mm -hmm. helpful as they try and get their 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 mental health in order. Right. Three mm -hmm. top foods. Okay, so I'm going to go with my favorite leafy greens. Um, I, I know people, my patients roll my roll their eyes when I say eat that leafy green salad, but they contain <laughs> folate, iron, uh, so many nutrients that you need, and folate, low levels of folate associated with depression. So you know, pack in those mm -hmm. those leafy greens, and alongside that, uh, build in the diversity of plants. So colorful, use the color of the rainbow, make it a game in your family, add in peppers, every every mm -hmm. color of veggie you can think of because mm -hmm. the biodiversity of the food we eat has been associated with the biodiversity of the microbiome and the health of the microbiome. So that's sort of my number one. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second one is omega-3s are often thought of as omega-3 fatty acids in relation to seafood. But if you don't eat seafood, they also exist in plants. And you can add it in with chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds. Uh, it's super easy to make hemp milk. Um, and so, so you know, it, 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 these are ways that you can get in plant-based sources of the short chain ALA um, into, 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 your, into your body. By the way, uh, the leafy greens and the veggies also give your gut fiber. So another another uh, add-in. And my third is actually my what I consider to be my my secret weapon uh, is spices because people yes. ignore spices. They're calorie-free, sugar-free, salt-free, and they make everything delicious. You can literally make the same veggies in a different way every evening for your family if that's what they like, but make it a totally different flavor profile. And I think that there's also powerful science behind the spices. Um, turmeric with a pinch of black pepper, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, lowers anxiety, helps mood, saffron. Um, things like oregano, rosemary, um, you know, all have uh, very powerful effects and they're easy to use. Um, so spices are my third one. Love yeah, and it. somebody in the chat was rooting for strawberries. I just want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> strawberries are great. Just get just get them organic if you if you can. And I know that's yes. hard it's super expensive, but but they're usually the number one on the environmental working group's dirty oh, dozen. Absolutely. That's the yes. reason. So go with frozen if you frozen is fine, you know, as long as there's no added syrup or sugar uh, or sauce. Frozen strawberries are fine, but it's one of the few that I have to say we usually have to go organic. Yeah, and one of the chat. You um, I'm sorry, one more chat was they wanted to make sure that people started to plant their own herb gardens. Yes. And 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 to buy organic. Okay. Abs absolutely. We we did a nice post on Infograph about a, a few weeks ago with your own mental health garden herb garden. Oh, wow. Just we, we picked like about five. Just to, just to, we did a graph, little image of the ones, some of them from the book. So I'd encourage people to check that out because it's a good way to get started. I was going to say in the book, and you mentioned it tonight. You mentioned blueberries, um, and I think I I am encouraging people to eat more blueberries. And I'm in New England, like you, uh, so we do have some really nice blueberry seasons when it comes around up here. Yes, <laughs> very good. So we've been putting up where people can find you, but tell us, tell the audience where they can find you. Thank you. Um, so you can find me on social media, which is at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O, -O, which is at Dr. Uma Naidu. And then just come visit my website, um, umanaidumd.com. Subscribe for my newsletter where you'll get my newsletter, my blog, and just updated information about what I'm up to. And we'd love to hear from you. Um, it's really uh, social media is I'm only on social media because of my book, but I really realized it's such a great uh, way to share a positive message. There is a way to use it um, uh, in a positive way to, to share this with other people. So that's why I'm there. Wonderful, wonderful. Those of you out there who, who are watching, please give it up for Dr. Nadu. I know we can't hear you, but she's <laughs> been incredible. Her work is incredible. This is a landmark professional who's joined us here today. And we've been so excited to, to listen to her wealth of knowledge and what she's done. So thank you again for all that you, you do thank and you, you continue thank to you. do. Absolutely. Uh, I also want to briefly say thank you to our sponsors, the Healthy Heart Nation, um, with uh, the moderator, Jeanette Batiste, as well as Brian Hardy, 
check out the website, myhhn.org, extremely helpful. I want to give a shout out as well to our next upcoming event. We plan on having Team Shereza is on. They wrote the Alzheimer's Solution um, and recently came out with the 30 day uh, challenge book too as well. So looking forward to that conversation. They have a lot to live up to with what was the bar that was set today on the 21st. We're looking forward to that. And as always, we want to make sure that you subscribe um, to us at Slave Food on, on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram underscore Slave Food and on Facebook here at Slave Food. Once again, thank you all so much for joining with us. Thank you, Eric. Signing off to you. Until next time, Danette, thank you. Dr. Nadu, I look forward to future thank collaborations. You. And to Absolutely. our guests, we'll see you next time. Thank you. So much.